Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 7, Text Number 45. This chapter is entitled, Lord Krishna Instructs Uddhava. Krishna, by his inconceivable plan, which can truly only be understood by his grace, through those personalities who have received his grace. He was performing his final pastimes in this material world. Everything was arranged for the Yadu dynasty to disappear. Krishna called for Uddhava. Uddhava could see what was happening. He could feel it. He was Krishna's closest associate in many ways. He would joke with Krishna. Krishna would discuss matters of the Yadu dynasty with him. He would submissively ask questions to Krishna, and Krishna, with confidential friendship, would seek his advice. They would sit together, walk together, lay down together, eat together. And out of his most special mercy to Uddhava, Krishna sent him to Vrindavan to send a message. The inhabitants of Vrindavan were weeping, their hearts broken, unable practically to eat or to sleep, thinking of Krishna in separation. The only thing that kept them alive was that Krishna promised he would return And when he does return, we have to be here for him, to serve him, to make him happy. With this hope, they lived. But days, weeks, months were passing. Years began passing and not a single word from Krishna. He promised he would return. They had complete faith, complete trust in Krishna being their ever-well-wisher. Still, when Krishna ate dirt, He told his mother, I did not eat dirt. So he does sometimes not tell the truth. (laughs) But he always tells the truth. But his lila is he tells the truth in various ways to increase the absorption of his devotee's love for him. The gopis, the gopas, they were waiting. Krishna wanted to not only increase the love of the Brijbasis, 
but he wanted to bring Uddhav to the threshold of the pure devotional service that only the Brijabhasis can understand. Uddhava, send this message to Nanda and Yashoda, to the gopas, to the gopis. Take my chariot so they know that I have sent you. When Uddhava went to Vrindavan, he thought he was going to do something for the Brijabhasis. When he saw their love and separation, the Viraha Bhava, he understood, I'm with Krishna every day. And every moment my love for him is increasing. But limitlessly greater than that is how moment by moment the Brijabhasi's love is increasing in separation. Manmanabhava mat bhakto, Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, offer your homage to me. In this way you will come to me without fail. All the injunctions, all the instructions, all the philosophical explanations of all the Vedic literatures are ultimately to bring us to follow two principles. To always remember Krishna and to never forget Krishna. Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti puravakam dadami buddha yogam tam yena mamopayantate. Krishna tells in Gita, he's there in the hearts revealing himself, revealing his will to one who serves him with love constantly. Uddhava was like that. He loved Krishna. Krishna loved him. It was impossible for Uddhava to forget Krishna for a moment. But it takes an enlightened person to really appreciate an enlightened person. Uddhava was on this very, very high standard of pure devotional service. So in this sense, he, he is an authority to understand who loves Krishna. When he saw Nanda and Yashoda weeping and crying, sometimes chastising Krishna, sometimes begging for Krishna's mercy, sometimes just worrying about Krishna as their own son. Not for them. Every thought, about, every thought for Krishna was only for Krishna, for Krishna's pleasure, his happiness, his well-being. I recently heard a wonderful lecture of Srila Prabhupada where he was talking about Das Das Anudas. <coughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that the highest aspiration is to be the servant of the servant of the servant. Anu, the very insignificant little servant of all servants of the Lord of the Gopis. Why Krishna, who is a humbija pratapita, he's the seed-giving father and mother of every living being. Sarvayoni shakuntiya murtiya samavantiya tasam brahma mahajonira humbija pratapita. All living beings are born of material nature, and Krishna says, I am the seed-giving father. He sarva karana karanam. 
the cause of all causes. Everything has a cause within this world. But Krishna is the summit of all existence. Everything is emanating from him. Aham sarvasya prabhava mata sarvam pravartate. Krishna tells, I'm the source of all spiritual and all material worlds. Everything emanates from me. So why would one want to be the mother of the cause of all causes, the absolute truth? Srila Prabhupada explained, because the mother is the best servant of her child. When there's a little child born from a mother, the mother is day and night thinking about that child. The child's depending on me. If she has to, she'll stay up all night. She'll work all day. She'll do everything, anything. She doesn't get paid. Just out of love, she serves. So who could be better servant in this world to someone than a mother is to a little child? So you showed Ananda they wanted to, they wanted the best possible service, unconditional service. As Drona and Dara, they did tapasya for a long time because they wanted to be mother and father of Krishna. And lover, that service which is embodied by gopis can never be understood without the mercy of the great souls. They were so engrossed, so engrossed in remembering Krishna's pastimes, chanting Krishna's names, making garlands for Krishna, making boga for Krishna, decorating forests for Krishna, unconditional, because physically Krishna never came to accept it. But that did not discourage them. It's not that after decorating Krishna's favorite places and churning butter just the way Krishna likes it to be made and everything they were doing and the most wonderful flowers, collecting them and making garlands and It was all there. All day they were serving, crying, Krishna, please come, accept this service. You will be happy. He didn't come. And the next day, and the next day, year after year, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood, Radha Bhava Duti Suvalitam Nome Krishna Swarupam, is the mood of Sri Radha in separation from Krishna. At the time when Uddhav came to Vrindavan, an ordinary person gets discouraged. If you do something and do something, seeking a result, and the result just never comes. There's not even a hint when it will come, if it will come. We get discouraged. We go on to something else. The result that the Brijabhasis were seeking is Krishna will receive how we're giving our hearts and our lives to make arrangements for his arrival every day. Year after year goes by. 
they never lost their enthusiasm. They never became discouraged. A devotee thinks like this, must be something I'm doing wrong. I'll do even better. They were increasing the quality of every, all their services day after day, year after year, with the hope that Krishna would come. And there was no Twitters or WhatsApps or Facebooks or any, any of that distractions in those days. Krishna didn't send any message to them. Nothing. Sometimes, at least remember me and give us assurance you're remembering by something. <coughs> Nothing. And their love was increasing more and more. Their gratitude for their love for Krishna was increasing more and more. Sarva dharman paritya mame kam sharanam paritya. Krishna tells the perfection of all dharma is to surrender to him. This sharanagati reached its pinnacle in the revelation to the world through the bridge Basi's love. In Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he taught that there is no love superior to the all inclusive love of the gopis of Vrindavan. And how Krishna tested it. And how the test, like fire, that's the subject of the verse today. When you take gold out of a mine, it's, you can't really appreciate its value. But when you put it in fire, all the impurities, all that's not gold is burnt away. And as the gold is in fire, it's in fire, it gets brighter and brighter. So this fire of separation, viraha prema, made the gold of the gopis' love for Krishna shine brighter and brighter at every moment. When Uddhava saw this, it was so spontaneous, so intimate. Beyond any kinds of rules, regulations, social etiquettes, it was just pure, ecstatic, all-encompassing love. If we try to imitate it, we will, be, we will lose whatever spiritual credits we have. We cannot imitate the gopis, gopas' love for Krishna but we hold it on the highest pedestal of our aspirations. When we think of the gopis' love, we realize how I have no love. It humbles us completely. and gives us a great determination to chant the holy names in this mood of being more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree. Offer all respect to others and expect none in return. In this way, we aspire to chant Krishna's name, remember Krishna constantly. This is actually what it means to follow in the footsteps of the gopis. Not to imitate, to pretend, 
but to appreciate how high they are. And if we're really appreciating it, we feel so low. And that was exactly what Krishna taught us through Uddhava. In Dwarka, everyone celebrates Uddhava. But when he came to the bridge Bhasis, he's a royal prince, very wealthy, very majestic, Yadu dynasty. And gopis are simple. The bridge Bhasis are just taking care of cows, and bulls, growing crops. Simple. But Udhav, he appreciated so much. He didn't want to be a gopi. He wanted to be a speck of, of, of dust. He wanted to be a little, a little shrub, a piece of grass that's growing near Govardhan Hill so that the gopas and the gopis and the hooves of the cows would step on his head. And by getting the dust of their feet, he could serve them. He could serve them because if he tried to serve them as Uddhava, they would be very uncomfortable. He was in such a superior social position. He wanted the most menial place. Gulmalata, little piece of grass. Let me eternally remain in Vrindavan. That was his prayer. And Krishna was so happy when Uddhav came back and explained everything to him. That you have understood. I sent you there. This is something you could have never learned from Brihaspati, your teacher. Brihaspati is the guru of the devatas. You could learn more than anyone, from any one of the little calves of Vrindavan than you can from Brihaspati. <laughs> How to love me. How to be totally absorbed in me. Uddhava is such a dear friend to Krishna. Krishna didn't send any of the other yadus to, to Rajbhumi to give any messages. Balaram went at one time, but Balaram is a Brijabhasi himself. <laughs> he knows. So what is the love, what is the attachment of Uddhava for Krishna? He's a student of Nanda, Yashoda, Sri Radharani, Lalita, Vishaka, Sudama, Subala, Sri Dhamma. He wanted to go with Krishna. I don't want to be in this world without you. But Krishna told him, you stay. You accept the renounced order of life. Go to Badrinath. I never went there. There are many devotees of mine who are waiting. Go and speak Harikata to them. Then Uddhava began in his desperation. So many of the most wonderful revelations of Krishna's mercy were given to people who were in desperation. Parikshit Maharaj was in desperation. He was going to die in seven days. Please instruct me. And Sukadev Goswami spoke Bhagavatam. 
Arjuna was in desperation. He was on the battlefield, surrounded by two armies, and he saw his own loved ones on both sides. Karapanya doso bahadasva bhava. Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. And perhaps even more than that, Uddhava. Krishna is about to leave. And he wants me to stay behind. So he inquired from Krishna. And Krishna's instructions to the whole world through Uddhava comprise the Uddhav Gita. So in these wonderful teachings, in this particular chapter, Krishna is telling a story about the great king Yadu, who happened to be his forefather. Yadu was king of the world. And he went into the forest. And while he was traveling through the forest, he happened to see this avadut. A person who really didn't have any nice clothes, like a king does. He didn't have a palace. He didn't have a house. Didn't have a flat. (laughs) He didn't even have a hut. He was homeless. He was just wandering in the forest. And what was he eating? Just whatever, he wasn't even looking for food. He didn't even care about it. Just kind of whatever came. This was quite fascinating. Because in the world we live, due to the association we have, we have this idea of what security is, what comfort is, what happiness is. We're taught. You have to go to school. You have to work hard. You have to, or else you have to marry somebody who works hard. (laughs) (laughs) And then, You know, you'll have nice car, and you'll have nice clothes, and you'll have a nice comfortable house, and you'll have security, and you'll have medical insurance, and you'll have life insurance, and you'll have... uh, And today, what Prabhupada called unnecessary necessities. (laughs) What's completely unnecessary, we think are so necessary just because of our association. Just a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, there was no electricity, there was no air conditioning, there was no telephones, there was no Bollywood cinemas, no television. So many things, but people, they didn't want them. They didn't want them, they didn't need them, because they're just unnecessary. But today, we think all these things are necessary. And getting that type of artificial, illusory security and sensual and mental enjoyment, we think that's happiness. And it's always been like that. The demigods, some of them are still like that. They're afraid they may lose something. And they're always never satisfied because they always want something more. Like fire, we're reading 
material desires, they blaze like fire. The more you feed them, the more it needs. So, this King Yadu, he understood human psychology. He was very learned. He was an enlightened person. How is it possible? Everything, everyone wants and needs to be happy. They're struggling to achieve. You don't have any of it. And I've never seen anyone so happy as you. He didn't have a wife, he didn't have children or grandchildren. He was just alone, just wandering through the jungle. He said, how is it you're so satisfied? You're at such peace without anything that everyone wants. The Avaduta explained that he had learned transformation forming lessons from 24 different gurus. And then he began to explain what he learned from the earth, from the water, from the sky. And today he's explaining the lessons he learned from fire. Srila Prabhupada gave us this simple formula to see through the eyes of the scriptures. We see through our ears. Because what we see with our eyes is subject to the illusion of maya. And sometimes maya is defined as that which is not. Very simple, confusing definition. <laughs> that which is not. How could is not? <laughs> because some, if something is, it has to, it, it has to be. <laughs> that which is not. So everything we think it is, it's not. <laughs> and the more we try to figure it out, we get entangled in Maya's not. So when we see through our ears, when we hear from the scriptures, Tadvigyana tam sagurum eva abhigatschet. Srila Prabhupada quotes from Upanishads that you can't understand the scriptures without guru. So when we hear from the great gurus, then we learn how to see. In the beginning, there's a little faith. It may have come from something we don't even remember we did. We may have just appreciated a devotee in a previous life. And Krishna reciprocates. He gives us a little faith. And that faith attracts us to the association of sadhus, of devotees. And in that, our faith becomes the guiding light of our life. We have faith that there is a God, that God is Krishna, all attractive, all loving, supremely beautiful. That I'm not this body, I'm not this flickering mind, I'm the eternal soul. And the only true need of the soul is to be reconnected with the Supreme Soul, with Krishna. 
in the association of devotees, we understand the futility, the emptiness of material enjoyment on any level, in this world or in the heavenly worlds. We understand that even mukti, liberation from suffering, is a distraction from the true aspiration of the pure soul. Nityasiddha Krishna Prema Satya Kabunai. To love Krishna, to serve Krishna, to give pleasure to Krishna. That's the true nature of the soul. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Ranityadas. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his foundational principle in which he built all of his teachings is this simple phrase that we are all eternal servants of Krishna. Only with that understanding can we cultivate love for Krishna. In such association of devotees, our faith in the process of bhakti leads us to sadhana. There are so many glorifications of the holy name in this age of Kali. Kavirato sanide raja nasti heka mahan guna kirtana deva krishna sya mukta sangha param Gives us, it gives us a vision. We see so many dangers, so many hypocrisies, so much pollution everywhere, within and outside. That's Kali Yuga. Padam padam yadvi padam natesham. In Kali Yuga, Life is so vulnerable. At any moment, whoever we are, disaster, death. Our hearts torn to shreds by circumstances. It's something that we really do not have any control over as long as we're on the material state of consciousness. It's Kali Yuga. In the name of religion, so much hatred. Bigotry, in the name of nationalism. Building of armaments and bombs directly pointed at each other. Kali Yuga is a dangerous place. In other Yugas, it was all bows and arrows. <laughs> <laughs> of course, some Brahmins had these ashtras that were better than bombs, but they never used them to hurt innocent people. Even Ashwatthama, as evil as he was, he sent that Brahmastra, which was a very specialized right to the womb of a mother. But now these types of bombs are so grotesque. Their manipulation of the subtle gross elements of earth, water, fire, air, ether. And the subtler you try to get power, the grosser the effect could be. And now these nuclear bombs, they're definitely Quite a few pointed right here in Mumbai. (laughs) And practically every other major city of the countries that we either live or know people. And it just takes somebody to press a button. Some (laughs) madman. That's all it takes.
And what to speak of traffic? <laughs> We're thinking, well, hopefully the bombs don't drop. But then a, one of these crazy truck drivers who's drunk falls asleep and crashes. Or it could be a crazy person in a Mercedes Benz, too. <laughs> doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> Whether you crash in a truck or you crash in a, in a Mercedes Benz, if you die, you die. No, they're not going to, you know, when your, your ashes, it's, it's not going to show any difference. <laughs> So there's danger. That's Kali Yuga. And so many temptations, so many advertisements. In previous yugas, all the advertisements were for dharma. Now the advertisements are just to distract. Attract to different types of experiences that we become desperately habituated to. We become habituated, addicted to so many things. Might be drugs, might be alcohol, might be cigarettes, it might be sex, it might be to technology, might be to various types of comforts. But there's one blessing in Kali Yuga. Simply chanting the names of Krishna, one can attain the supreme perfection of liberation. In this age of Kali, in the association of devotees, we understand this. We, we, as we hear from Vaishnavas, we develop deeper and deeper faith in the process of sadhana and seva, in the nine processes of devotional service. So many of us here at Sri Sri Radha Gopinath Temple, when we see Sri Sri Radha Gopinath, we feel such shelter. We're see, we can feel that we're being seen by God, and we're seeing God. But how does that happen? Because we've heard from great souls that this is Krish, this is Sri Radharani and Krishna, Archana. We understand. Saravana kirtana smarana bandana pada sevana dasyade pujana sakijana atmane vedana. That there's these nine processes of devotional service. Prahlad Maharaj spoke about it. Great souls like Prithu Maharaj worship deities, Ambarish Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj. That Krishna reciprocates. Srila Prabhupada in a lecture was giving an example of one person from a, from, a very, um, from a very powerful organization in India. They were against deity worship. Said, said to challenge Prabhupada, why do you offer food to Krishna? Why does God have to come in the form of a deity to eat? And if God is Atmarama, if he's self-satisfied, why does he have to eat? God doesn't eat. Prabhupada. He quoted this verse. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita that if you offer him a fruit, a leaf, a little water, a flower, he will eat it. And Prabhupada said to this person, God says he eats, and you say he doesn't eat. 
So should I believe you? Should I believe Krishna or a loafer like you? <laughs> so so many of us were cooking. Many of the devotees of the congregation and the ashram are going to the kitchen every day and cooking for so many hours, and Gorgadara Prabhu is down in his own little kitchen cooking. <laughs> so many. And on festivals, hundreds of people are cooking and bringing their, they, every day cooking and offering to the deities at their homes and on festival coming, and very excitedly, such enthusiasm. Why are we doing this? Because we heard. Because we're seeing the deity through our ears. Yes, this is Krishna. Yes, he does accept our offerings. And we have our sadhana, and we have our seva. We're eager to hear, we're eager to chant, we're eager to serve. And through that process, our faith becomes very deep, nishta. And gradually, asha, we, we awaken this deep attachment to Krishna, and then the higher taste, and ultimately love for Krishna awakens. Sadhu Sangha Sadhu Sangha Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Lava Matra Sadhu Sangha Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Lord Chaitanya emphasized such great, in such an incredible analogy, that even a single moment, Lava Matra, an image, a moment's association with the Sadhu, can open the doors to the greatest liberation. Because in that association, we get faith, we get blessings, which give us the strength to perform our sadhana and our seva. And to follow these regulative principles of freedom by which we have the strength to resist those things that are unfavorable for our Krishna consciousness. And this Avaduta is telling King Yadu that through this process, I can hear the messages of Krishna through the simplest forms of nature that everyone sees every day. We see the sun, we're experiencing air, we see the moon at night, we see the ocean here in Mumbai. He was learning priceless, enlightening, life-changing lessons from pigeons. How many of us had that experience when we see pigeons? <laughs> Seek and ye shall find. When we're sadhakarahi, when we're looking for the essence, then Krishna reveals himself. Today's verse, the lessons he learned from his guru in the form of fire. In today's verse, it is being explained that fire can burn so many different types of objects and is not affected by the objects. If you put stool in fire, if you put diamonds in fire, the fire doesn't get clean or dirty by either of them. Fire is fire. In due course, it just consumes everything. 
when it's not affected by it. And similarly, great personalities. Bhavadvida Bhagavatas Tirata Bhuta Swayam Vipu. Bhagavatam tells that great souls, they are holy places personified. Wherever they go, becomes purified. Wherever a pure devotee is who loves Krishna, that place becomes a holy place. In fact, in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it tells that people go to holy places for the purpose of taking a bath. But actually, the true benefits of going to a holy place is to associate with the holy people there. And what does it mean to associate? To actually understand the greatness of holy people. To be submissive, to inquire from them, to hear from them, to serve them. That's the greatness of a pilgrimage. Great people like fire. They purify. In some places, there's the sacred fire. The sacred fire is one of the most ancient, timeless ways of worshiping the Lord. Homa, Yajna. Well, we understand that Krishna, the Supreme Lord Vishnu, actually receives our offering in the form of fire. And in the sacred fire, we only put the purest things in it. Ghee. Along with mantra, we offer ghee to the sacred fire. And we understand that according to our love, our devotion, as we're offering this, Lord Vishnu is accepting it and he's reciprocating with us. Just like we offer puja to the, de- to the deity, we offer puja to Srila Prabhupada. The Agnihotra, we're offering, we're making offerings to Vishnu in the form of fire. And it's so sacred. Since time immemorial, in special junctions of our life, when we take initiation, we make vows and offerings to the sacred fire. When we're married, we take lifelong vows and offer, make offerings to the sacred fire. Great holy people, as explained here, they accept our offerings. Here in Srimad Bhagavatam it tells, sometimes fire is concealed. But then it blazes. Just like if you have little coals, hot coals, it's under sand or under ashes. You don't even know that the coals are under ashes, but you stir it and the fire comes up. So similarly, great personalities usually just want to be left alone. (laughs) They're just happy chanting, hearing. Why do they go out and take so much trouble just to give light to others? Let us take Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, as an example. Srila Prabhupada was in Vrindavan at Radhadamodar Temple, at Seva Kunj. He was next door to Rupa Goswami and Jiva Goswami. 
He had no ambitions for anything beyond that. Years later, when he had a beautiful apartment, a room in Los Angeles, he told one of his intimate associates, I'm just yearning and longing to be back at Radha Damodar Temple. Those little, little rooms, very simple. He was happy. He was in Vrindavan, the place of the Nitya Lila. Nobody knew who Prabhupada was. But so much trouble. Like fire, he came out of his concealment by the order of his Guru Maharaj, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. That blazing coal of his ecstatic love, which was under the ashes of being unknown to anyone in this world, it was stirred and he came out and he lit the whole world on fire with bhakti. The Prabhupada. <laughs> Hanuman also, when he was in Sri Lanka, <laughs> he lit the whole city on fire. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada. The fire of bhakti, it does two things. One is it burns away impurities. Anartas. And two is it illuminates our hearts with, with devotion, with bhakti, with prema, with love. And for most people, they like to be praised. And they like when people do things for them because it makes them feel important. <laughs> but an enlightened person doesn't need any of that stuff because he's happy knowing Krishna is important. That's all that matters. Krishna is supremely important and I love Krishna and nothing can ever change that. Krishna, I'm yours. Manaso deho geho jo kichu Everything is yours, Krishna. I'm yours. My family is yours. That's our happiness. But when people get praised and people do things for them, the tendency of ordinary people is to get proud, to see how great I am. But like fire, you offer ghee to fire. You offer wonderful sesame seeds or rice to fire. The rice consumes it. Vishnu consumes it in the fire. And similarly, such a great personality like Srila Prabhupada came out of his concealment in Vrindavan, entered into the world, and people were praising him. People were doing so many services for him, giving their lives, doing anything for him. But as explained here, the fire is not affected. Why? Because great devotees are attached to Krishna. They know everything belongs to Krishna. They're just representatives of Krishna. Nothing is mine. Whatever praise someone's giving to me. Krishna says in the Gita, I'm the source of intelligence. I'm the source of all abilities. I'm the source of everything that exists. If somebody's saying something good about you or me, ultimately they're praising Krishna. And the more we get praised, the more humble we become to understand it's not about me. Punar Mushtaka Bhava. This is a devotee's consciousness. If Krishna wants to give me, I can give so much. 
But as soon as I think I'm the giver, Krishna can make a little mouse into a lion. That's what he does for some devotees. He makes little mice into lions. Some are nice mice. (laughs) Some are not. But Krishna can make us a lion. But if we start taking credit and thinking it's mine, it's for me, he could make us again a mouse. So this principle of humility is so important. If we have that humility, that everything is the property of Krishna, and that comes deeper and deeper as we become more attached to Krishna. As we become more attached to Krishna and take a higher taste in being Krishna's servant and seeing Krishna's greatness, By serving great personalities, great Vaishnavas, our attraction, our taste for hearing about Krishna awakens and, and grows. And as we're actually developing this taste, we understand that this false pride is a pitiful degradation of our real spirit. It's a great impediment. It's a distraction. But like fire, one who is really attached to Krishna, they can take anything. Srila Prabhupada was sometimes so bold. When a nice car picked him up at the airport, a a reporter challenged him, why such a nice car? You're supposed to be detached. He said, nothing's mine. I'm just doing for, I'm accepting on behalf of Krishna. Even if they pick me up in a solid gold Rolls Royce, it wouldn't be good enough. (laughs) Because it's not for me, it's for Krishna. Now, I don't know if the reporter understood what he was saying. (laughs) but he was saying it for all time to come for everybody. Like fire, can accept praise, can accept things, but it's not for me. That's what's being explained here in Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna is everywhere. Fire is within wood. If it wasn't within wood, if you just touch fire with some fire, how does fire come out of it? The fire is not because you're just touching the the wood with a little piece of fire this big, and now it's a huge fire. Where's that fire coming from? It's in the wood. So similarly, a great soul sees that Krishna is everywhere. Krishna is within everyone's heart as the Paramatma. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, everything is Krishna's property. So even when we see things that appear to be mundane, or even when we see people who are mundane, we don't just see that, we see the potential within them. Great personalities, they see that potential. Wherever Srila Prabhupada was in the world, whether he was in the Lower East Side of New York, whether he was in Moscow, with practically no opportunity to do anything, he could see the potential to love Krishna in every heart. And it's only someone who sees that potential who could bring out that potential. 
by giving us the process of hearing and chanting, by giving us the process of association of devotees, he's actually fanning that spark. He's actually first by the, his association, he's awakening that little tiny spark, even if it's covered by millions of lifetimes of material ego and attachment. In the association, if we just become a little receptive, that potential, that spark is, is awakened within us. Even when completely dormant, Srila Prabhupada knew the spark was there. He could see it. And once it was awakened, he taught us to fan it and make it into a blazing fire. And if we remain steady, determined to follow the process by Krishna's grace, it burns away all the illusions all that which is not in our consciousness. Ragad Vishiva Muktais tu Vishayan Andreyaishadan Atma Vishavad Hyatma Prasada Madhikachati. By following these rules and regulations, these regulative principles of freedom, one could transcend attachments and aversions by the grace of the Lord. Fire. If you build a fire with wood, after some times it goes down and down and down and down. It needs more wood to, to consume. So naturally, fire just keeps going down if it doesn't have anything to eat. So if you want to keep a fire going, there has to be effort. Gaur Shakti, Rishabdev, they're here from New Vrindavan. In the earlier days at New Vrindavan, there was no heating except wood fires. And in the winter, it really, it's just like Badrinath. <laughs> Massive snow, freezing cold. For over six months a year, it's like that. And for some of us, we never had the opportunity to even have a fire because we're just too busy. There wasn't time to make a fire. Because to make a fire, you have to go out into the forest and cut trees down. And you weren't allowed to cut live trees. You had to find dead trees. And there's not that many dead trees. You have to find a dead tree. Then with a little axe, you have to... And then, you have to, and then it falls down. Then what do you do with it when it falls down? And then you have to cut it in smaller pieces. Then you have to carry it back to the stove. Then you have to cut it small enough to fit in the stove. And most of the matches were like wet. So then how do you light it? So many efforts to light it. And then it starts going and it's freezing cold. It's many, many degrees below zero. And there's high winds. And the fire's going and you feel a little warm. But then the fire's going down and down and you have to go out and chop more trees <laughs> and cut more wood and bring it in from the forest and put it on the fire. If you want to keep the fire going, there's a lot of work. So that's a nice lesson of fire too. The fire of bhakti. It's not that we just chant 16 rounds one day and then, okay, that's good. Ragat Vaishya Vemuktaish Tu Vishaya Anandrayaish Charan Atma Vishaya Vidhe Atma Prasada Madhikachchati. It's all dependent on Krishna's grace. Yeyatam Amparapadyante Tamstataiva Bajamyam. Krishna reciprocates. Krishna's grace comes according to 
our efforts, our humility, and our dependence on his mercy. Srila Prabhupada would tell us, work now, samadhi later. Have you ever heard that before? But in the context sometimes that his representatives told us this, it was very challenging. (laughs) In other words, in the pure state, pure devotion is spontaneous and effortless. But for a conditioned soul, we have to work very hard to keep the fire of bhakti going. We can't be lazy. That was a quality that Srila Prabhupada did not appreciate. Laziness. He wanted devotees to be very alert, to be very determined, enthusiastic. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, in order to spread Krishna consciousness, we must have enthusiasm. If you're not enthusiastic, then you're spiritually like dead. In our sadhana, in our seva, in our following the proper principles, there has to be effort. That shows that we're sincere. And Krishna reciprocates with that sincerity, like fire. Another quality of fire. Should I continue? If you have to go, please go. (laughs) But at least stay for this one. (laughs) When fire is controlled, it has so many benefits. We cook with fire to satisfy our hunger. We stay warm with fire to protect us from freezing cold. And fire gives us light to protect us from darkness. This electricity Sometimes we don't understand this electricity is nothing but the power of fire. All the light within the universe is just coming by fire. The sun. The sun is penetrating into trees. And the fire element, heat and warmth, is entering the tree deep inside. The tree is permeated by that energy of the sun. And that's why when you light a tree, it produces fire, heat and light. When they fall down, they go into the ground. After many, many years, they're underground. It becomes coal. Many, many more years, millions of years, becomes oil. It's all coming from the trees absorbing sunlight. Such a power of the sun. The energy of the sun goes into a tree. Millions and millions and millions of years later, way deep down underground, it's now just oil. You take it out put a spark on it and a little oxygen, it's fire. And that's what this is all about. That's how these lights and these chandeliers are illuminating us. Interesting. There's air conditioning in this place. That's coming from electricity. It's the fire that originates in the sun that's keeping us cool. (laughs) Such a nice balance. The sun outside is 
95 degrees hot, and we come inside and the sun is making it cool for us. Inconceivable potencies of the Lord. The more we, we see Krishna as the origin of everything, the more fascinating everything becomes with a purpose. All the cars driving on oil, or even the electric cars on batteries, same thing. It's all coming from the fire of the sun. So when, when fire is in a controlled st- stage, it has such great benefits for us. But when fire is out of control, <laughs> Devastation, infernal death. It's nothing you could do practically. And it happens all the time. You're just cooking, and somehow or other you just forget to turn the stove off, and it touches the curtain, and then the curtain goes on fire, and then soon the entire house is on fire. Everything's burning. Then the whole neighborhood was on fire. I remember when I was a little boy, my father would take me to this place called the Water Tower. It's a very famous place. It's in downtown Chicago. There's a story with this old lady named Mrs. Leary back in the 1800s, I think. She had a cow and she was milking her cow at night with a little lantern. And somehow or other, the, she left the place and the cow kicked over the lantern and her barn got on fire and it burned the entire city of Chicago. He said, this water tower, which is solid stone, it's one of the only buildings that survived. So I was thinking, one little flame this big that's in a lamp, as soon as it was not in a controlled environment, it burned an entire city. At that time, the second largest city in America. It's fire. Fire is so dangerous. In most places, if you have a public place, in order to be legal and not totally shut down, there has to be so many fire regulations that are inspected and passed. You have to have different fire extinguishers in different places, and you have to, from every place, you need so many ladders going down for people to escape, and exit signs so that people can get out. Because fire can happen anywhere. Because everyone's using fire. If you have electricity, the wires just get mixed up and they go, and the whole building's on fire. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. When he was at Radha Kund with Srila Prabhupada, he said, the mat is on fire. Because the devotees were quarreling with each other over who should get the most authority, who should get the, mo- the best facilities. And please understand, these were very highly qualified people. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when you have this desire for prestige, when you have this pratishta, and you have this desire for control over facilities, that's a disqualification. It neutralizes our qualifications. He said, now we have this beautiful temple, wonderful ashram, and people, now the devotees are becoming antagonistic and competitive in an egoistic way to try to get it for themselves. He said, it's like a fire in the mat. And we know the effects of fire. That's when he told Srila Prabhupada, if you get money, print and distribute books. But 
But at the same time, in the same temple, every day they're offering arti. And with the arti, there's the deepa, the little, it's, it's, the, it's the essence of the arti, is the offering that flame. Sometimes a little candle with five flames, ghee, ghee wicks, that are dipped in ghee, and we offer it. And it's an offering of our love. It's an offering of the fire element, Krishna, I'm yours. So in every temple, we're coming to celebrate those little giwiks being offered to Krishna, fire. But if any one of those little giwiks fall to the floor and are not attended to properly, <laughs> fire. And this principle, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was explaining, you're all getting intelligence, you're all getting knowledge, you're all getting empowered to accomplish so many different things. That's a gift of Krishna to spread Krishna consciousness. But as soon as we think it's ours, as soon as that thinking out, I and mine, then we become insecure. We be, we're vulnerable to envy. We're vulnerable to selfishness. Then we start, then we start fighting. And when, these, when there becomes this ill motives toward each other, it's like fire. It burns everything. The mind and the senses are like fire. Our mind and senses are sacred. It's what we have to serve Krishna. Manmanabhavamadbhakto. How could we remember Krishna if we don't have a mind? So the mind is sacred. With our mind we remember Krishna. It's the cause of our liberation. Sarvopadi Vinirmuktam. That beautiful verse, if we use our mind and senses in the service of the Lord of the senses, Rishikesh, we become purified. So by engaging our mind and senses in Krishna's service, we become purified and we purify others. In the impersonalistic schools, we want to deny the mind and senses. In the Vaishnav Siddhanta, we understand that the mind and senses are Krishna's property. Better than having no thoughts is to remember Krishna. Better than doing nothing is to engage in Krishna's service. The Brijabhasis were never idle. Idle mind is devil's workshop. The Brijabhasis were always engaged in Krishna's loving service. That's what it means to follow in their footsteps. So the same mind and senses, Bandhuratmat Manastasya, the Gita tells, for the mind that is uncontrolled, it is the greatest enemy. But the mind that's controlled is our best of friends. In fact, Srimad Bhagavatam tells Rishabdev, Jad Bharat, that the uncontrolled mind is our only enemy. Fire. Samsara dava nalalita loka. The blazing fire of material existence. No one can extinguish it through fire departments, through water, through airplanes dropping powder. Only surrendering to Krishna can relieve us from the blazing forest fire of material existence. And our gurus are teaching us how to do that. 
So the mind and senses are like fire. There's a famous saying, don't play with fire. (laughs) Have you heard this? Every good mother, sometime or another, has to tell their children, don't play with fire. If you play with fire, you'll be burnt, and it may even burn all of us. Fire has to be treated very carefully. We have to be very serious. We have to understand the dangers. These mind and senses are the wonderful facilities Krishna has given us for the highest liberation. Like fire, the mind and senses give us light, give us light, the light of grace, Krishna's grace. But when uncontrolled, the mind and senses can burn, burn like fire. Yato yato nishtaliti manas chanchanamatmaram. Gita tells whenever and wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly bring it back to Krishna to the service of Krishna, to remembering Krishna, to chanting Krishna's holy name. In the Gayatri Mantra, the first line, the Brahma Gayatri, we're surrendering our hearts with humility and love and gratitude to Surya Narayan, to Krishna, who is within the sun. He's the Paramatma of Surya. It's by Krishna tells in Gita, Raso Hamapsukontiya Prabhashni Shashi Surya I'm the light of the sun and the moon. The sun is Krishna's energy. And everything that's existing in this universe is dependent on the mercy coming from the sun. How great, how incredible. So we recognize that. We recognize Krishna as the light of the sun and the light of the moon, the light of everything that illuminates and preserves us. And the two great avatars, Rama and Krishna, Ramchandra appeared in the Raghu dynasty, the solar dynasty, and Krishna appeared in the Um, Yadu dynasty, which is the moon. The sun and the moon, Krishna tells, they are the illuminating factors within us, in our lives. And the Lord has appeared in these two dynasties to illuminate us. When Dasarat Maharaj had no children, Vishishtamuni and Rishya Shringa, they performed a yajna. It was a very, very technical, sacred, elaborate yajna that lasted many days. Aswamedha. And at the very conclusion of the yajna, they chanted mantras and offered oblation of ghee into the fire. (laughs) Amazing. From the fire, this celestial divine personality appeared. He was so beautiful. He came right out of the flames of the fire. He was holding a golden pot. 
Dasarat Maharaj, beyond, besides himself with ecstatic gratitude, was looking at this personality. Everyone was. And he said, I am representing Lord Vishnu. He gave the pot to Dasarat Maharaj and said, you share this with your wives and your cherished desire to have children will be fulfilled. Dasarat Maharaj and all the sages and rishis circumambulated that great personality, then he entered back into the fire and disappeared. Dasarat gave half that Amrita that was in the pot to Kosalya and half to Kaikei. And each of them gave a part to Sumitra. And the four children were born, Ram, Bharat, Lakshman, Satrugna. So Ram's appearance in this world was from fire. In Panchabati, Nasik, there's a place near the Godavari River in Tapavan where Sita entered into a fire and was protected by Agni Dev and put into the care of Parvati because she was about to be stolen by Ravana. And that expansion illusory sita appeared from the fire. Then after the great battle of Sri Lanka, where Hanuman, he really used fire in Krishna's service, Ram's service. Because fire destroys. Hanuman, they soaked, they put giant quantities of flammable cloth on his tail, then soaked it, drenched it in oil, then lit it. His tail was blazing. They wanted to torture him. Then they were beating him. He was tied up in ropes publicly. And people were coming to see this monkey with a tail on fire being beaten. And Hanuman, he wasn't thinking, oh, why is this happening to me? <laughs> Hanuman was thinking, how can I serve Ram in this situation? And when we really want to serve, Tesham Satata Yuktanam Bajatam Priti Puravakam Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantati. Krishna gives the intelligence. Oh, he says, he could be thinking, terrible fire, it's burning me, it hurts. Why? He was thinking, how could I serve? He was seeing the opportunity. He wasn't never Hanuman never anything negative could stay in his mind. It was all positive. Yes, this is wonderful. <laughs> and he the fire reminded him of his potential. He broke through the ropes, he expanded in size, he jumped to the top of the building, and with his tail, <laughs> he lit the entire building. This great palace was blazing on fire, and people were jumping out windows, they were screaming, they were crying, and Hanuman was smiling. <laughs> and he jumped to the next building and touched his tail. <laughs> And he was just using his propensities as a monkey to jump from building to building to building. <laughs> and every building and all the Rakshashas, Indrajit and Ravan and all of these, they didn't know, they were helpless. You see, when you try to hurt a Vaishnav, when you try to light the tail of a Vaishnava on fire, ultimately it lights you on fire. <laughs> uh, 
And then after the battle was complete, then Sita was brought back to Rameshwaram area. And then she said to Lakshman, start a fire. And Sita entered into the fire to test the purity of her heart. And when she entered that fire, she just walked into a blazing fire. And she was completely disappeared in the flames. And Ram was crying, and Lakshman was crying. He built the fire, but Sita ordered it, and Ram approved of it. It was really a moment. It was the most theatrical moment of of history, practically. Sita entered the fire and disappeared for some time. And then Agni came out of the fire with the original Sita, resplendent with joy. She passed, she didn't exactly pass the test. She showed the entire universe for all time to come, the spotless, pure love for Ram she had. And just after that, they boarded the Pushpaka, Ravana's airship, (laughs) and went back to Ayodhya. The 14 years of exiles had expired. And the people of Ayodhya, like the Brijabhasis in their own way, they were in deep, inconceivable love and separation for all those years. Kosalya, Dasarat couldn't even wait. He left his body in separation. The fire of his separation consumed him. And all the inhabitants of Ayodhya welcomed Ram at night with lamps, burning deepas, lamps. And that was the original Diwali, Deepavali. So we celebrate the new year with fire. (laughs) Fire illuminates. It brings light and removes darkness. And Krishna, on Diwali, same day, (laughs) but a yuga later, (laughs) Yashodamai was churning butter, churning dahi, yogurt, into butter. And she was singing songs of Krishna and motherly love, and milk started coming from her out of her motherly affection, and Krishna became hungry, and he jumped out of his bed and ran over, and and he didn't have to say anything. He just held the wooden... um, the churning rod, like an Udupi. Udupi Krishna's holding the churning rod and holding the rope, telling Yashodamai that, I'm hungry. So she picked up Krishna and started feeding him her milk. But then in the next room, a fire was burning. <laughs> There was this Padma Ganda, this very, very special nectarine milk that Yashodamai would personally uh, arrange for Krishna every day. It was boiling to make wonderful sweets for Krishna. And it started boiling over. And Yashodamai put Krishna down to, to save the milk from the fire. You see, just like that, the milk was making the... It, it, Fire, if you're not attentive, it could make 
Sandesh. <laughs> if you are attentive, it could make Sandesh. But if you're not attentive, it could burn it. Nobody likes burnt milk, at least. Nobody, <laughs> nobody I know. So you showed him I went to protect the milk from getting burnt, so it could be a nice offering to Krishna, and we know what Krishna did after that. And some years later, after Krishna danced on the heads of Kaliya, and he surrendered by the grace of his wives, then Krishna and the Brijabhasis let us take rest here in the forest tonight. It was such a beautiful evening. Peacocks were cawing. <laughs> you're, you're really out of practice. <laughs> It's a matter not of what you sound like, but the enthusiasm in which you do. <laughs> so please try again. <laughs> and so many sweet night birds were cooing. And the breeze coming from Mother Yamuna was... <laughs> filled with the aromas of, of malati flowers and sweet lotus flowers, malika flowers, kadamba flowers. And the stars were illuminating the sky, and Krishna was right there with them, smiling. They all fell asleep. Suddenly they woke up. There was a fire. On all four sides around them was this enormous fire. It was so high, you couldn't even see how high it was. It was practically up to the clouds. <laughs> A thick wall of, sire, of solid fire all around them. They all turned to Krishna. The cows were looking at Krishna. The calves were looking at Krishna with tears in their eyes. The gopas, the gopis. They taught us how to turn to Krishna. It's one of the principles of surrender to exclusively depend on Krishna. And Krishna, with one slight inhalation, he swallowed the whole fire. And didn't even get burnt. with that little mouth that ate dirt and then showed the universe to his mother, he swallowed an entire forest fire within a moment. And it never came back. Now Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, Upananda, Abhinanda, Sunanda, all these elder cowherd men, what were they thinking? They were very happy Krishna saved their lives. But Krishna, you know, he cries. <laughs> he cries when I don't feed him, Yashodamai is thinking. They're always worried that he might step on a thorn or he might get scratched by a monkey. Here he just 
swallowed an entire forest fire. A mood of happiness and ecstatic worry out of motherly and fatherly love. And the cowherd boys and the gopis, they were just Krishna. Gargamuni said that Narayan has appeared as Krishna, but we don't believe him. Krishna is just Krishna. But how he's doing these things? And I'll end with one more little story about fire. The Harinam Sankirtan movement began publicly in a very serious crisis situation. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told the innocent people of Navadweep that always chant Krishna's names. Whether you're walking or sitting or eating or sleeping or working, always remember Krishna's names. Even if you're alone, sing Krishna's names. And with your families, clap your hands and sing Krishna's names together. If you have instruments, mardangas, karatals, whatever it may be, play them and sing Krishna's names. Everyone constantly always chant Krishna's names. And they loved him so much. So many hundreds, thousands of people would throughout Navad we were chanting Krishna's names. And when the Chan Kazi saw people chanting, he was outraged. There was a law against this. He was persecuted by keep people. If I find anyone singing publicly these Hindu names, I will beat you, I will imprison you, I will take away all your property. And he was doing it. He had a hundred military guards at all times just searching for anyone who was chanting. And they beat them. So they brought this information to Lord Chaitanya. Maybe we should leave this place because they don't look that the government is against this chanting. This is what they're doing. And Lord Chaitanya said, don't worry, just go on chanting. But he saw that they were in so much anxiety. Then Lord Chaitanya said, today, Nityananda Prabhu, spread the word to all the devotees that you should assemble at my house, everyone, and bring a torch. The word spread. Lord Chaitanya said, what will the Kazi do to me? Today, time personified will stand before the Chan Kazi. I have come to this world like a great, to bring the great rainstorm of Harinam Sankirtan and Krishna Prema to inundate all the illusion and drown everyone with love for Krishna. Today, I will go into the street to dance. This was really exciting because except for a few devotees in the house of Srivas or the house of Sachi, nobody had ever seen Lord Chaitanya dance. The kirtan was contained only among the most intimate, loving, advanced devotees within these Srivasangam, closed places. But now Lord Chaitanya was inaugurating for the first time the Harinam Sankirtan movement, Nagara Sankirtan, public. Hundreds and thousands of people started making torches. 
They were getting the sticks. They were getting the cloth. They were wrapping the sticks with the cloth. They're getting oils and dipping in oils. Sometimes the father was making, sometimes the children were making, the mothers were making, the daughters were making, the sons were making, the uncles were making, everyone was busy making torches. The whole Navadweep was making torches. There were millions of torches made. And they all came. Millions of people holding torches. Lord Chaitanya began the kirtan. He started to dance. Advaita Charya was dancing. Gadadhar Pandit was dancing. Srivas Thakur was dancing. Haridas Thakur was dancing. Nityananda Prabhu was dancing. Vakreshwar Pandit was dancing. Mukunda was dancing. It was incredible. And Lord Chaitanya was dancing in such a way that everyone could see him. That's a miracle. When there's millions of people and they're all standing on the street, it wasn't like a stadium, but everyone could see him dancing. Everyone could see him crying in ecstasy. Then the sun set. They were going along the bank of the Ganga and Lord Chaitanya gave the word the torches. And at that moment, all these millions of torches were lit at the same moment. And the entire sky was illuminated. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu led this kirtan dancing and chanting along with Lord Nityananda and Gadadhar and all of the associates and the people of Navadweep through the marketplaces, through all the bathing ghats, through the entire town of Navadweep, and ultimately approached the house of Chand Kazi. Chand Kazi said, he heard this loud kirtan. He said, what is that? Must be one of those Hindu marriages. <laughs> go. He told his military guards, go and find out what this is. And they went. And they came running back. They said, this Nimai Pandit, he has millions of people chanting and they all have torches. And they're all coming. And he, he's chanting these names of Hari Hari. He said, it's tumultuous in all directions, these guards were telling, in all directions, filling the sky, the water, everything is the loud chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, And some of the people looked really mad. They were saying, we will burn the Kazi's house. <laughs> John Kazi said, what will they do to me? We will stop them. This Nimai Pandit's become a very madman. But then, some of his guards came. And they said, they were, they were chanting the name so loud. I was so afraid. And suddenly, my beard caught on fire. <laughs> Look, I'm all burnt. And others were hiding their beards. And others, to not be detected, they raised our arms and started to dance and chant the holy names. (laughs) 
Chan Kasi, because he had a powerful military, he was the ruler of that area of Nadia. He said, if they come anywhere close, we will destroy them. We will arrest them all, and we will arrest this Nimai and beat everybody. He was so sure of himself. But then, the Kirtan party turned the corner and were coming very close. And he saw the torches and he heard the tumultuous sound of the holy names with the Murdungas and the Karatals. Chan Kazi ran into his house to a secret place to hide. <laughs> and Nimai came and knocked on the door. <laughs> And John Kazi came out, and Nimai said, I'm a guest at your house, why are you hiding? And John Kazi said, you're, you look like you're in a very angry mood, and you have all these, all these millions of people with you, and everyone has torches. And actually, I was, a, I was a good friend of your grandfather, so that makes me your uncle. So even if I did something wrong, you know, in family matters, <laughs> please don't take it seriously. And Lord Chaitanya was so kind. He addressed Chan Kazi, oh, my uncle. <laughs> and they had a nice talk. And Lord Chaitanya revealed himself because Chan Kazi became humble and surrendered. He understood you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He didn't externally change his religion. Allah, Jehovah, these are all names for the one God. He understood that the devotees are chanting the names of the one God, Krishna, Rama, Hare. And he understood that Gora Chandra, Gor Hadi, was that one God who had appeared in this age of Kali to give what no other incarnation has ever given, the intimate ecstatic love of the residents of Vrindavan through the Hari Nam Sankirtan movement to anyone, whatever their background, who's willing to open their hearts to receive it with all sincerity. And Chan Kazi made a law. He told Lord Chaitanya, all in my lifetime and all my descendants, no one will ever interfere with the congregational chanting of Krishna's holy name. <laughs> So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu engaged fire as a very prominent part of that wonderful pastime of the first Harinam Sankirtan movement in public. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, he compares Sankirtan to fire. Chaitu Dharapana Marachanam Bhava Mahadavagni Nirvapanam that the seven-tongued flame of Sankirtan, how it removes all the anartas, all the unwanted things of the heart, how it illuminates and awakens the true knowledge of the soul, anandam buddhivartanam. It illuminates the ecstasy that we're all yearning for the ecstasy of prema, loving service to Sri Krishna. Sankirtan is compared to this sacred fire. 
burns away all of our lust, anger, envy, greed, arrogance, and illusion. And then it illuminates our hearts with the light of knowledge and love. Paramakaruna pahunduhi jana nitai gora chandra. Tava avatara sara siromani kevala anandakanda. Bhaja bhaja bhai. Chaitanya nitai. Sudri davish vasha kori. Simple process. Chanting, dancing. Thank you very much.